Hey guys, I'm Matt Lewis and this is the news. Coming up, we're going to talk to Jeremy Peters, but first, a special thank you first to you, the supporters of this show on Patreon. We couldn't do this podcast without you. Thank you for your support. And if you're not supporting us, please go to patreon.com slash Matt Lewis and do so. We also really appreciate it if you would rate and review us on iTunes. If you're listening on iTunes, please do that. I also want to thank our sponsor for today's show, the Leadership Institute. Uh, we're taping here at the Leadership Institute, by the way, and, and those of you who know me know I'm a huge fan. I actually worked here for four years. I interned here. The Leadership Institute is America's premier conservative training organization. If you want to run for political office, work on a campaign, uh, learn how to go on TV, whatever it is that you want to do, there's probably a workshop or seminar at the Leadership Institute for you. Check them out at leadershipinstitute.org. All right, our guest today, Jeremy Peters. You're a political reporter for the New York Times, and one of the beats uh, that you cover is the conservative movement. Jeremy Peters, thank you for coming on the news. Thanks for having me. Uh, so this is a, a sort of a broad question. Um, we're going to talk a lot about the conservative movement and Donald Trump. And I'll just open with uh, how did we get here? As <laughs> When you look at the conservative movement, and I know you covered like the Romney campaign in 2012, and we're sitting here now in 2019. Talk about some of the trends that got us here. Maybe things that surprised you. Right. I mean, it feels like an entire political generation has passed us by going from 2008 when Obama was first elected to 2016 when Trump was elected. But in a lot of ways, many of the same trends and attitudes and emotions that were so potent in conservative and Republican politics are manifesting themselves today and were really responsible for getting us to Donald Trump. And I think that you start with Sarah Palin in 2008, this populist Republican governor who was anti-establishment, who then becomes somewhat radicalized once she sees that taking on Obama, sometimes in not so subtly racial, religious tones, gets her an audience, a national following. And she becomes a much bigger figure in the party, much more important for where it was going than her running mate, the Republican nominee himself, John McCain. Yeah, and I think in some ways maybe Palin is like a John the Baptist, kind of, of a har harbinger of things to come for the Republican Party and Trump, and maybe even for the Democrats and the squad. Yeah, I think so. I think that you did have a lot of the same types of attacks coming from the right against uh, Obama that you kind of see now, again, directed at Ilhan Omar and Cortez, there's the, you know, the obvious uh, trading on, you know, th th their ethnic differences, right? Like, you know, Rush Limbaugh and others would always say Barack Hussein Obama. Uh, and there's a lot of that going on with Ilhan Omar and AOC, right? You know, the, the emphasizing that their names sound different and Trump's constant repetition of Omar, Omar, Omar in a way that he doesn't say other people's names. It's meant to call attention to their otherness and it, it's working. Well, the, one of the things that's happening now, I think just in general, like in the media, and, and is there's a fine line between like satire and satire and dog whistles. And I think the alt-right were very good at sort of putting things out there that like were maybe anti-Semitic, but then, oh, you just don't get it. It's just a joke. And, and I think that part of what Rush does is he's an entertainer. And so like when he'll say Cortez's last name and he does it like in a Spanish accent. I mean, you could sort of write that off as like, hey, I'm just having fun. I'm just being funny. Um, Which is exactly what he does. Yeah. Right? It's, it, and, and, you know, they've been doing that for a long time, these guys. It's, it's like, well, no, you're, you're the ones, the people on the left and the main, mainstream media who have it wrong when you get all bent out of shape because I'm just trying to have a good time. But I think there are listeners in his audience who certainly see Ilhan Omar and AOC for their ethnicity and as anti-American because people like Rush talk that way. Right. So we start off with, I think Palin was definitely, if, if you're charting this from 2008, certainly Palin's a big uh, data point. Um, Obama, Obama's re-election, certainly the, the recession, uh, the Tea Party. What are some of the, some of the moments that you think 
were important. You know, I've been working on a book about this now for the last year or so writing it. And one of the things that I, I think is so interesting when you go back and you look at some of these moments and how catalytic they were is you look closely enough. Not only were the emotions there and, and, and the anxiety and the frustrations, but Trump was there himself as well. Because Trump, of course, has a relationship with Sarah Palin that starts earlier than most people realize. It starts in about 2010, 11. He's been watching her. He sees her on TV being the, the voracious consumer of cable news that he is. And he says to himself, you know, if she, if she can do that, I can do it. Because she, of course, has a Fox gig. She was one of the first to really utilize her platform on Fox to become a populist conservative phenomenon. And it's not that far after that when you have Donald Trump who starts talking about Barack Obama's birth certificate, which Palin never really touched. Uh, she just kind of more insinuated other things like Obama palling around with terrorists or whatever, but she never directly questioned where he was born. Um, Trump, however, being this, taking it to the next level, having absolutely no shame whatsoever when it comes to these kind of culturally, racially, yeah. ethnically charged issues, takes it to the next level. And I think what you get with, with Trump is a, an extension and an almost kind of Palin on steroids type figure who's much better at controlling his image in the media and much better really at, at, at getting people, I know this is gonna sound funny because so few people actually did take him seriously, but getting people to see him as certain people at least, to get to see him as a leader, as a, as, yeah. as a fighter in a way that she was never really well, it's, seen. I mean, it sort of makes sense because Sarah Palin was like mayor of Wasilla and ultimately, you know, I guess governor of Alaska, but Donald Trump had been uh, fine tuning and honing his craft in New York City for three or four decades and, and manipulating the tabloid press there. So it makes sense that Trump, in a way, would be better at it than Sarah Palin. Oh yeah, absolutely. And his training in media, his, the, the fact that he was a reality television star at a broadcast television network helped immensely. I mean, he, it, it, you look at him today when he comes down the stairs of Air Force One or he steps out of the White House or he is sitting there at the, at the Resolute desk in the Oval Office, he has this sixth sense for where the camera is, where the lighting should be, where his best angle is. And it's that kind of positioning, this, this, you know, this, this ultimate reality show presidency that we got that started with a reality show that became a reality show presidential campaign that really explains a lot about why Donald Trump had such mass popular appeal. Yeah, now you're from Michigan, I think the Detroit suburbs. Right. Um, where, not far from where Mitt Romney uh, grew up, um, not quite as fancy a neighborhood, but near enough. <laughs> so, no, I guess that, that, in a way, that undermines my argument, <laughs> um, which is to say, you know, this is the Rust Belt. So you're at right. least familiar, you're around working class folks, at least, you know, in the same state. It's a Rust Belt state. Did that give you, as a reporter covering the conservative movement, did that give you any insight, maybe, uh, in the plight of middle America? I remember once going to a Trump rally outside of Flint, Michigan in August of 2015. And it was the first time I saw one where thousands and people, thousands and thousands of people showed up. I'd seen them before, uh, but in small towns in New Hampshire where hundreds of people showed up and that was still pretty unusual. But to see outside of Flint, Michigan, these people waiting in line in the hot sun to see Donald Trump something was amiss. And I, I went back and I talked to folks later who were working for the state Republican Party and asked them, at what point did you start to sense that Michigan was in play? And they all traced it back to that particular mm. rally because they didn't recognize the people there when they were signing or trying to get signatures for a petition for something that was going to be on the ballot they couldn't get the signatures because it was for this traditional kind of uh, this, this obscure issue, local issue, um, that you think most Tea Party type fiscal conservatives would be for. They couldn't get people to sign it. And what's more is they didn't see the people that you would usually see at a Republican rally. They saw a lot of union t-shirts, for example. Yeah. And that was a, a, the first real sense that I had, uh, and, and others have validated this, that really there was something 
wrong in the Republican Party that they weren't showing up to see Jeb Bush. Yeah. They weren't showing up uh, to see Marco Rubio. They were there to see Trump. You mentioned the Tea Party, and this is a movement which um, ostensibly was, was about uh, fiscal sanity and, and worried about uh, right. you know, the economy and Supposedly. spending. <laughs> and, and, but now the, a lot of the Tea Party folks, and like the Freedom Caucus, for example, are perfectly fine with Donald Trump and the ballooning debt and deficits, which I think raises the question, were they ever, was the Tea Party movement ever really about fiscal responsibility and worries about, you know, passing on to our grandchildren our debt, or, or was there something else lurking underneath? So I've been thinking about this a lot lately, and I think that because the Tea Party fundamentally was an anti-Obama movement, an anti-left movement, they were much more concerned with the debt and the spending when it was being controlled by Democrats and Obama, who was for them, like the avatar of the failed socialist state. He's going to do to our country what happened in Western Europe and look at how, look at in, uh, Europe in decline. Fast forward to Donald Trump and his message of American renewal and greatness. And I think what you get is two things. A captivating leader who has created this following that really is, is, is more about personality than it is about policy. You have that, and then you have the idea that, okay, he's taking our country in a different direction. We're more comfortable with where he's going than we were under Obama. So we can kind of overlook some of this stuff on the fiscal side, the ballooning deficit, and as long as he's delivering on other things, as long as we can be confident that he has built this economy kept it strong and will keep us on that path. Now, of course, <laughs> I mean, the debt and the deficit levels are just unbelievable. And I find it hard to believe that if you were to put these guys to a lie detector machine, they would say that they were not at all concerned about the spending bill that their president had just signed. I'd love to get your, um, I don't know, uh, analysis on conservatives. So like, from my standpoint, I can tell you, like I, when I was a kid growing up, it was like Alex P. Keaton and yeah. Ronald Reagan, right? And they were both pretty awesome, right? And Ray, I listened to Reagan's rhetoric, which was by and large. I mean, I know there are people talk about some of the uh, examples, but by and large, it was optimistic and unifying and inspirational. And um, and then, you know, I wasn't a huge George W. Bush fan, but it, you know, just sort of if you go a linear progression, you get to George W. Bush, and he's talking about how family values don't end at the Rio Grande, right? Yeah. And so we had you know Reagan and Kemp; those were kind of the big influences. And I, I believe that that's basically what conservatism was, right? And then you end up with maybe like a Marco Rubio, right? Not a about Donald Trump, <laughs> the right to rise, and Paul Ryan, and that kind of thing. Um, yeah, and all those so, guys who came of age when Reagan was president yeah. in the 80s, right? They were kind right. of like the natural inheritors of his legacy. Absolutely. And you interview a ton of conservatives. Like I know there are a lot of people who are very well sourced in Congress, like they talk to staffers and politicians like the Freedom Caucus. But you talk to a lot of conservative movement leaders. And I know we're all individuals. I mean, everyone's different. I'm not a conservative movement leader, but everyone's, everyone's different. But like just a psychological profile, I mean, there's a cognitive dissonance going on. Like, are, what do you read when you talk to people who, like, grew up with Reagan and now they have Trump? What do you think happened? How did, you know, it's, it's a weird question to ask, no. I realize, but I'm, I'm, I'm so fascinated by this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Well, this is, <laughs> this is kind of what I've been struggling with over the last years. I've been writing this book, right? Because it's how do you go from Reagan, who had this optimistic message, who was, by all accounts, like a cheery, warm guy to a president who is really, in so many ways, just the opposite. Uh, this Republican I was talking to the other day who's very critical of Trump made the point that, you know, Reagan was never a bully. Like, you may have disagreed with him on policy, and there may have been some policies he enacted uh, or he failed to act on, like HIV, AIDS, uh, the, you know, the homelessness problem in, in, in the United States uh, th that, you know, caused certain people real harm. Uh, you can take issue with that. But 
at his core, he wasn't a mean-spirited individual. You can't say that about Donald Trump. This is what a lot of Republicans will say. Like, if you, if you compare Trump to Reagan, yes, on some level, there is, you know, the, the certain message of, of you know, American exceptionalism and, and reasserting ourselves as the leading world power, although I think a lot of people take issue with that. That's really where Trump is, is taking us. Um, but the personality gap is just so great. I think people who are critics of Trump would say the character gap gap is just so vast. Yeah. So I think what you get there over you know, the course of those, those three decades is a sense that the country had changed considerably since Reagan was president and in ways that people found to be not just uncomfortable, but beyond what they ever could have expected their country looking like. And, and I think that manifested itself for different people in different ways. Some people saw, you know, the religious liberty issue, for example, and same-sex marriage as a real turning point. Some of them saw what they believed to be socialized medicine under Obamacare. Um, they had their homes taken away from them. They lost their jobs. There was you know, this, this, yeah. this great recession. And they went to you know, a, a darker place than Reagan ever took them. And the, the despair that set in in the 2008, 9, 10 period was really darker than anything you saw during Reagan's tenure. And I think that allowed somebody like Trump to come along who, on the one hand, would say his message is one that is forward-looking and about taking America uh, back and, you know, back from what, of course, but, but taking America and putting it back on track and making it great again had real resonance with people. And it didn't always have to be a happy message because people weren't happy. This is where I'm out of touch because I, for me, I, 2008, 2009, seemed like pretty good times. Maybe it's just me. I was doing good personally. But I think if you went by a lot of metrics, America is pretty much a time of peace and prosperity. And by a lot of metrics, things were better than they had been. So I always thought it was kind of weird that people had this very gloomy thing. Now look, I think Reagan was viewed as being, uh, at the time, was viewed as being kind of this crazy bomb thrower. He was portrayed that way, at least by, by Democrats. Yeah, and like his first very name especially, water. right. Um, and Reagan did have an appeal to like the working class uh, Reagan Democrats. So, so there, are, there is a similarity. But I think that some of the Trump voters today would say, sort of along the lines of what you were getting at, they would say two things. Like one, Reagan had to be nice and play by these rules. Because back when Reagan was president, you had these three major networks, the New York Times and the Washington, the failing New York Times and the Washington Post. And you couldn't have an infrastructure like a, a, a blogosphere. Reagan didn't have Twitter. So he had to play by their rules. Now you don't have to. And then uh, in line with what you were getting at, I think they would say that the left has gotten so much more angry and radical in recent years. And um, I don't know if I would buy that that was true in 2008, but I definitely think maybe as a response to Trump, ironically, the left has gone pretty radical recently. Oh yeah, absolutely. There's no doubt about it. I mean, you can see it in an issue like immigration where what used to be normal centrist democratic positions on border security, for example, are now just off the table entirely because they are tainted by Trump. Yeah. Trump and the wall and Trump emphasizing border security uh, and, and reductions in immigration levels. Like These are things that Democrats supported. And now, I mean, forget about it. So there, there is that, absolutely. I do think one of the, one of the questions you have to ask yourself with, with Reagan is you know, whether or not the economic prosperity during that time, you know, the, the, kind of the, the, the rebound that people felt from Carter to Reagan's first term, like the whole morning in America thing, whether or not that's just a completely different dynamic than Trump is dealing with. Because while things haven't, things didn't start out as, as, as bad um, under Trump, they haven't really gotten so much better that you could make the case that, yes, we've turned a corner like Reagan did. And if anything, 
there are an awful lot of people in this country who feel like we've turned backwards, that our, our, our political norms, our sense of civility and decency and what we expect from our political leaders has been so degraded and corroded that it's, it's not mourning in America by any stretch of the imagination. And they, that's what Biden is running on, this message of, and, and other Democrats would be wise to pick this up too, is we've got to stop this. There's a real anger out there that we've got to stop what's happening in a way that wasn't present when Reagan was running in 1984 and things had really gone and been going upwards on an upward trajectory. Reagan also had to work with Democrats in a way that Trump has failed to even really try to do. Um, and you have to ask yourself, what, what role does Mitch McConnell play in all of that in creating such a, a, a toxic atmosphere yeah. on Capitol Hill with these judicial confirmations and the Supreme Court confirmations. If that Trump comes into office and he has a Democratic Senate and a Democratic House, as Reagan did, exactly. does he govern differently? Does he right. talk differently? I don't, I don't know. So I don't I think, think Trump so. is the only one to blame here. Uh, I think you also have to look at the Republican Senate. Yeah, I want to talk a little bit about your background. So I mentioned you're from Michigan, uh, and I know that you... Um, uh, you were in the Virgin Islands, I think, I was, doing, yeah. as a reporter for a yeah. little while. And, and I know you were like a stringer uh, for the New York Times mm -hmm. um, before you ended up landing there like as, a, as an official political reporter. How did you, though, even start writing? Like, were you, as a, as a kid, were you a good writer? Well, I guess uh, one of the ways I got into journalism was, we didn't necessarily have to do with shining any light on the truth or, or you know, exposing... Uh, exposing character, bad deeds or anything like that, it was probably a little bit narcissistic more than anything else because I started writing movie reviews. I thought that, you know, I had something to say and people should hear it or read it in my high school newspaper. So I started doing movie reviews and, and I just really liked expressing myself through writing, expressing my opinions. And that kind of became uh, a way for me to then, once I graduated from high school, went into college and it became a way for me to start getting involved in a real newspaper. And I went to the University of Michigan and there's a daily newspaper there, the Michigan Daily. And so, you know, five days a week, you're working as a college student putting out this product that is solely produced by students. And that's an incredibly complicated, difficult undertaking for a bunch of 18, 19, 20 year olds. Yeah. So it just, I think, really connected me to journalism and, and made me feel like a real sense of ownership and pride in the craft uh, in, in a way that made me realize, well, unlike all my friends who are gonna go to law school or business school or whatever, this is a career path that I want to pursue. I was fortunate enough that the New York Times had an office in Ann Arbor where a New York Times correspondent was working. He needed some help, so I helped out here and there and interned, him for a little, interned for him for a little while and then went on to the Virgin Islands because I figured, well, I would, you know, <laughs> hey, who doesn't want to spend their uh, their years uh, right out of college on like an extended spring break? Sounds it didn't good to me. end up that way really because it was a lot of work and at a small newspaper like that, you're writing three, four stories a day sometimes. Yeah. But it was a good experience growth-wise to take you out of your comfort zone and move to a tiny island thousands of miles away from home and really kind of see a different culture and to cover that culture as an outsider was very interesting because it wasn't always comfortable. You're, as a reporter, exposing the government for its inefficiencies, sometimes its corruption, mismanagement, and if you're coming from the outside, especially if you're of a different race because the Virgin Islands is overwhelmingly black, it got awkward at times, and there were accusations always thrown at the newspaper you know, by local politicians that you know, there was this inherent racial bias. I never saw it that way, um, but it did kind of force you to realize that people are going to see you and your journalism differently um, in, in all walks of life, in all subject matters, and it, it was a real lesson. Probably good training, too, for... Oh We're yeah, dealing with uh, exactly current <laughs> climate. So you said about okay. uh, you started off writing these movie reviews. Is that just a way to get your foot in the door, or are you are you a movie buff? Yeah, I like at the time. You know, this was this was in the late '90s, so there was like this golden age of film, from you know Fargo to Pulp Fiction, and I just was really you know, go, go, basically going to see a movie every weekend, even before I could drive. I would go with my dad and go see screenings and watch Siskel and Ebert and you know reading the New York Times reviews and. 
Uh, and so that was, uh, you know, kind of my, uh, my hobby in high school, later high school. And it just happened to be that, that you know, I d ended up going into news writing. I don't think there was anything that kind of, I, I think I wanted the, I liked the energy of a daily news cycle more than I liked being, you know, a, a cultural critic of yeah. any kind. Um, just this is kind of better suited to my, my metabolism. How do you, it has to be hard to ramp up to, to write intelligently and fairly to cover, to report on something. You go to the Virgin Islands, you have to know who the, the players are, the local culture, the customs, the tradition. Right. You covered the auto industry. I mean, you grew up in Michigan, but you probably had to learn a little bit about the auto industry and the economy. Uh, and now covering the conservative movement, how did you, how do you ramp up? Because you could, you could look silly. You could you could get the wrong Brent Bozell or something, yeah. you know. <laughs> Which or, I've done, yeah. You know, um, you, could, you could look silly in the New York Times and confirm the stereotype about, you know, the liberal elite New York Times uh, reporter. Like, how did you ramp up on that? Yeah, so that's, it's a great question because I think that if it's learning by your mistakes, right? So there were inevitably the times where you would get something wrong. And it was, a, you know, especially when I started out in the Virgin Islands, that kind of sensitivity about writing about a culture that was different from yours, uh, it was really kind of ingrained in me. And being extra sensitive to not, you know, assuming that you know everything, right? And as a 22 year old, that can be hard because, you know, 22 year olds always think they know everything. But, you know, I felt, I, I just felt that in covering conservatives, especially, uh, as long as you listen to them and you present yourself, because remember, I mean, I'm coming from the New York Times. I might as well have like a scarlet letter branded on me or you know, people assume that I, I have a, a hammer and sickle tattooed on my arm uh, at first when I approach them. And once I think you just let them know that you're curious in why they believe what they believe, who they support, these kinds of things. It goes a long way, you know, because because I think people will see me hopefully for what I am, which is like sincere and earnest and trying to actually figure out why we are in this moment that we are in. So you develop relationships and sources with conservatives, and they'll gain trust knowing that when you write something or report something, they may not agree with the way it comes out, but you're not, it's not gonna be a gotcha, you're not out to like screw them or something. I think a big lesson from the whole Trump era and the mistakes that the media made in 2015 and 16 was not taking him seriously. And I think that taking my subjects seriously, taking the subject matter seriously as a viable political movement, as a real potent force in American politics right now, uh, that these people who you know, who show up at the Trump rallies are part of something bigger that's happening in our country right now. Treating them that way goes a long way. Yeah. Well, my, my mom voted for Trump. You know, drove people to the polls to vote for Trump. And my mom's a great person. Um, I've met Donald Trump exactly once. I found him to be actually delightful <laughs> in person. Uh, how much interaction have you have you had with him? I'm guessing maybe um, he probably. Love he he hate loves the New York Times so yeah uh, it's, it's like a yeah. hate read uh, but he always had a, a reverence and a respect for what we did remember famously after he was elected came to the New York Times and called it a jewel right it's not exactly enemy of the state type talk but I got to know Trump writing for the New York Times as I did uh, in New York when I was actually working for the Metro desk and I was covering local pol state politics and there was a proposal on the table in Albany that would have implemented a millionaire's tax because this is right around the time that New York State, like many other states, were facing this huge fiscal crisis. And I thought to myself, you know, looking back on it somewhat naively, like, well, why don't I just call like one of the richest guys in town and see what he thinks about this millionaire's tax? And sure enough, I called Donald Trump, uh, expecting to leave a message with an assistant that you know, he'll call you back, which is usually what happens when you're a reporter calling for somebody who's high profile. He got right on the phone. In fact, I was on the other line with my mom because she had called <laughs> while I was on hold with the Trump Organization. And I was talking to her for a, wh a while and I hear somebody click in on the other end on my work phone. Um, I'm talking to my mom on my cell phone. 
And I say, yeah, hold on a second. And I finish the conversation with my mom, click back over, and it's Donald Trump who's been on hold that whole time. <laughs> so I felt kind of bad about that, but he didn't hold it against me. It did hang up on me, thank God. Uh, but he, point being, he really wanted to talk to the New York Times. Uh, he wants, wants to talk to a lot of media. And I, every once in a while, would bring him up for a story I was working on. I think the next time I really talked with him extensively was in, two, would have been 2010 or 11, no, it would have been 11, right when he had kicked up the whole birther controversy and seized that as his way of getting attention and learned very quickly that it was a way to get the Tea Party, Sarah Palin type conservatives really energized. And I don't think he actually believed any of this at first. I think he saw it as something that got him affirmation and something that got applause and something that would get him booked on Bill O'Reilly and Sean Hannity. But that was, I think, a real lesson to him. And it's a lesson that he carried forward into the 2016 campaign. So you recently wrote a piece, uh, it's not about the conservative movement, it called Pete Buttigieg's Life in the Closet. And you talk about how he actually came out pretty late in life. Mm -hmm. And and the piece uh, talks about how politics is maybe uh, an area that was let, that was maybe less accommodating for someone who was gay. Uh, if you were in a different industry, maybe you would come out sooner. This was on the heels, if I remember correctly, your piece was on the heels of, of, a, new, of a New Republic piece mm -hmm. that, that was very pull, right? yeah. very homophobic. Odd. I'm not sure how I would even describe that piece. It was very yeah. mean yeah. Uh, and, cond and condescending. What kind of response have you gotten from that piece, like from Mayor Buttigieg or from others? Well, I never heard from the mayor or from any of his people about it, which uh, you know tells me that I think they were probably fine with it. Uh, usually you hear if they don't, like <laughs> yeah. it, if there are problems with it. So they didn't ask for any corrections or anything like that. Uh, and I, I mean, that piece was, I think, unique in telling Pete's story because, you know, obviously coming from the David Axelrod, Barack Obama school of politics, your narrative is very important. And Pete understands that. He has told his story very well. He's told certain parts of his story that he wants us to know and wants to emphasize uh, over and over and, and left us with like a certain impression of what it was like for him to come out, then get married very quickly and to be accepted and to have that be fine. But I felt like what hadn't been told was the extent to which he struggled with this and the environment in which he did that. And you have to remember, this is like a rapidly changing time for people who were struggling to come out of the closet for gay rights and for acceptance, because his class, and you know, I'm his age, and I, I can remember this, you know, by the time you get to college, like, you know, Matthew Shepard had just been murdered in Wyoming. The number of openly gay national political figure, figures you could probably count on one hand. And there were all of these ballot initiatives being pushed in states to enact constitutional amendments that would ban same-sex marriage, um, supported by a lot of Democrats, by the way. So, uh, you know, things changed from that to, you know, over, Matt, over the course of like five or six years, being much more accepted. States started passing gay marriage, making it legal. The courts were pushing it through, and more, more and more politicians came out. Culturally, it became more accepting. You'd see more openly gay characters portrayed on television shows and in the movies. And some people took that as a reason to come out. Like, okay, now I can finally make, it's not this career ending, like this, this, this social life destroying move. Uh, people will accept me for who I am. Pete took longer to come to that realization. And when I talked to him about it, it, it seemed pretty clear that what he was really worried about was the political component. Uh, some people would say that's very calculating, and they would say that that's not really how they would have done it. Uh, it's not how they did it. But I think you know he was pretty honest with me, and I give him, have to give him some credit for this, in saying, look, I knew that I always wanted to go in politics because you know, he was the president of the Institute of Politics at Harvard. He had thought about running for office. Uh, he had gone into the Navy Reserves. He had plotted his life along very carefully. 
to a certain endpoint, an endpoint which one of his friends candidly told me in the piece was to be president of the United States. And at the time, it was unthinkable to him that there could ever be an openly gay candidate for the president of the United States. And I, I think he was right at that point. So to see him all of a sudden go from this closeted 33-year-old to, at 37, the first credible, serious, openly gay candidate for president is pretty remarkable. Yeah. So you've written about your sexual orientation before. Um, I don't think I'm outing anything here. <laughs> no. You've written about this, I think. Right. Yeah, no, I have, yes. Um, did, did that, it, I don't know if, if you want to talk about how that might have impacted yeah. the way you viewed that story or if journalism is different from politics, if you felt some of the same things that he felt. I did. That's what I was so drawn to like reporting out in, in the piece because at the same time that Pete was wrestling with this, I remember having the same types of conversations in my head, of course, not really with anybody else because I didn't want to talk to, about it with anybody else. But thinking, okay, what would happen to me? What would happen to my circle of friends? Would my relationships change? What would happen at work? Would I, as a reporter, be treated differently, especially in a place like the Virgin Islands where, you know, in the Caribbean, homophobia is endemic, it remains that way. And I, because that's where I ended up coming out when I was 23. And it was this, conversation just like Pete described. Okay, when is it going to be okay? Am I going to be accepted? Um, I think media is kind of a different profession than politics, so I had you know the, the, the luxury of not really having to worry about it. I wasn't planning on running for president of the United States someday, so I didn't think about it in those types of, uh, of lofty terms. But it was one of those situations where our experience in those few years, being born from like you know 1978 to 2002 or whatever, when you are coming of age, graduating college, having your first real job, and also struggling with this secret and how to start telling people, was very unique. It's like this certain this micro generation, and it coincided with this rapid cultural, political, and legal change that no one had ever seen before. Barack Obama was against gay marriage not that long ago. Right. So it was so really it's very quick. Yeah, it was really like for people like me, it was really the sense of whiplash. Like what okay, going from like unthinkable to realistic to fact, right? It's it's happening. And I think that was disorienting for a lot of people. What do you make out of that that new republic piece though? Like they called him uh, instead of Mary instead of Mayor Pete, they called him Mary Pete. Right. What's what's behind that kind of like? Help me make yeah. sense of this. Um, why, why does that get why does that get written? Yeah. Why does that get greenlit? A lack of editing um, and probably the downsizing at an yeah. institution like the New Republic that doesn't have the kind of guardrails that it used to, where they just kind of let things slip through the cracks that otherwise wouldn't have. I think that's probably it more than anything else. I can't imagine. Uh, I really can't. I, it was so puzzling why they ran something like that that was so derogatory. Like I kept waiting for the moment in the piece where it said, this is a joke, this is satire, right? <laughs> right. But it never, it never came. Well, speaking of the media, I remembered what I was gonna ask you earlier that it slipped my mind. Um, how much do you blame the media for Trump getting elected and then for taking the bait and helping kind of advance Trump's whatever, whatever you don't like about Trump, I feel like the media is actually kind of helping perpetuate it in a way. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's a, it's, it's a real problem that as we get further into the democratic primary process, that responsible news organizations are going to have to reckon with, right? You have these two dozen candidates, it won't be two dozen by then, but it'll be maybe a dozen. They're running, yet Trump is commanding such an outsized amount of attention, and he is really kind of dictating the terms of their primary fight, forcing them and really forcing, not forcing, but leading the moderators to ask these questions about issues that are really only being debated by a small portion of the Democratic Party, this you know very uh, far left activist group that says, yes, we should give health care to undocumented, undocumented immigrants. Um, we should decriminalize crossing the border illegally, we should take away private insurance. Like th These are not 
proposals, ideas that have a large constituency. Yet, if you listen to the questions at the debate, you would think that this is what everybody in the Democratic Party right now is preoccupied with. That's not been my experience yeah. in going out in the country and talking to voters. In fact, the opposite has been the case. Like They're worried about their own bottom lines. And I think what a lot of people will say, just to, using immigration as an example, wait, you know, you're talking about taking away my health care, but then giving it to somebody who's here illegally? That's a big problem for the party. And the, and the smartest Democratic strategists I talk to know that and are trying to figure out a way to pull the conversation back toward the center. But I think it's kind of a problem that you saw in, it, it's the same kind of problem you saw in 2012 when Romney was running and got all tripped up over contraception. And there was this question about, you know, whether or not he really believed that contraception was right. And it- I'm still skeptical. That was a weird question. It really was. That was George Stephanopoulos, I, I believe. believe so. And You're it right. was out of the blue. And it seemed to me to be a setup seems like he was fed that by Democrats or something, because it was apropos of nothing as far as I'm concerned. It was completely random. I think Romney was surprised. And 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 then all of a sudden, Clearly he was. it leads yeah. to this war on women thing. And it just, it was a weird question. I'm very curious about that. I don't know the genesis of it, but I do know that it was so far afield and left people with, I think like, a, it, 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 Romney didn't do a great job of answering no. it, so he has to own that himself. But it left people with a kind of a, 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 an incorrect perception of where the Republican mainstream was on something as basic as contraception, um, which you know no one at the time was seriously talking about outlawing. Um, it, it's so I think that when moderators ask questions that are outside of Raise kind of your the, hand if yeah. you believe in evolution or something. Right. Yeah, yeah exactly. Like those, you know, I, I get it. They're, they're, they're great moments for TV. But ultimately, what service are they to voters when they're kind of just fodder for yeah. the other political team, right? Sometimes I think that Donald Trump is writing these questions himself. <laughs> like when Kamala Harris got asked, do you think that extending voting rights to felons means that the terrorists who committed the Boston bombing should be allowed to vote too. And she says, we have to have a conversation about that. No, that's not yeah. a conversation. Well, this is what Republicans, <laughs> we went, need to be Republicans having. went through the mirror image of this in 12 and 16 yes. in their primaries. Exactly. And the funny thing is, it's oftentimes your own ostensibly team, right? In this case, it's MSNBC asking hard questions uh, to Democrats or, or wedge issues, actually. And uh, oftentimes it with Fox would be, uh, doing that to Republicans. You brought up a point with Romney uh, being asked about contraception, though. What do you say to Republicans and conservatives who feel like, look, Mitt Romney was a really decent, honorable guy. We nominated him, and the Democrats and the media talked about Seamus on the roof of the car and giving kids haircuts and um, binders full of women and mocked him for saying that Russia was, you know, our number one geopolitical foe. So why should we nominate someone nice like Mitt Romney when you're going to do, you're going to call him a racist, you're going to call him a homophobe, you're going to call him a sexist anyway. Let's give you Donald Trump. He at least knows how to fight. Right, right. And and doesn't so much push back uh, on those types of accusations. When <laughs> they're hurled at he just counterattacks. He doesn't, he doesn't respond. Well, look, I mean, I would turn the question around somewhat and, and say, well, you know, let's not forget who it was who rejected Romney at first. I mean, it was the conservative base of the party that was in constant search of anybody but Romney. I mean, first Rick Perry, Herman Cain, Newt Gingrich, Rick Santorum, Romney took a long time to put away rivals that were much lesser than and much and didn't have the funding that he had. Uh, it would be, and that should have been a red flag. You know, that should have been... It's a sign to the party that, you know, we're not quite doing something right here. So, yes, while it's true, the Democrats did an awful lot of damage to Romney's image. And some of those were factually questionable. And I'm putting that charitably. You know, the, the attacks on his record and uh, at, at Bain. Um, yeah, a lot of those were really, really aggressive. And, and in retrospect, um, you know, for Pinocchio kind of material. Yeah. And it, it worked in damaging him. Uh, but at the same time, Newt Gingrich was saying the same things. Newt Gingrich was attacking his record at Bain, which is interesting when you go back and you think that there was this kind of uh, like populist 
critique from the right about Mitt this, Romney speaks French. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Mitt Romney when Mitt Romney when Bain came to town. Right. Yeah. Then he laid people off, or that you know he, uh, he he liked to be able to fire people. You know there was a, a, a sense that Democrats fed not only Democrats fed into, the, yeah. but the Republicans did too. That Mitt Romney was going to be ill suited for for this time, this moment in the Republican Party, and you know he was. I mean, let's face it, that it was an example of the party leaders. Um, certain, you know, Washington-centric Republicans kind of being, I think, uh, having their eye off the ball with regard to what voters really wanted because, I mean, look at, look at Romney's father, right? Here's yeah. a guy who ran for president, you know, was, uh, was governor of Michigan, and as the CEO of you know, a pretty large car company, capped his salary, gave back some of his bonus, and at Romney, I mean, it, Romney, I think, you know, granted, we've talked about his, how his record, you know, w was, was distorted at, at Bain, but, you know, you can't imagine the Republican Party applauding something like that today, or at least Romney's Republican Total Party. Loser. Right, exactly. <laughs> what a sap. Right. Yeah. Um, so uh, I guess we'll send on, on the forthcoming book. Um, I guess one question I would have is, you know, we're now in the Trump era for, for two and a half years or whatever. Um, and you have Michael Wolf has come out with a couple of very controversial but very gossipy books. Um, Tim Alberta uh, came out with a very kind of uh, heralded and, and popular book about the administration. Does this create pressure on you? Or are you just like, no, I'm going to play my game. I'm going to do my reporting. Like, are you, yeah. Do you have to like kind of look in the rearview mirror and see what other people are doing? Oh, yeah, always. You have to adjust. And there have been moments when you know, I will read – one of these books that's been written about the Trump administration and say, oh, I had that story and now yeah. it's out there. So you have to adjust like that. Um, I do think, you know, watching the success of these books has been both like, heartening and terrifying because <laughs> it's heartening that there's interest, right? Whether or not that interest remains, I don't know. But it also, you know, sets a really high bar. And yeah. that's a little terrifying. Uh, so it kind of gives me a lot more incentive to make my book different. My book was always going to be a little different than any of the ones that I've seen out there. It wasn't going to be a, you know, a gossipy inside the West Wing account of all the infighting. Um, it wasn't going to be a you know, comprehensive history of the, the Republican Party. It was more going to be a look at the people, the institutions, the moments that got us to Donald Trump, the moments when you look back on them and through re-reporting and, and analysis and talking to the players involved on the front lines, you get a sense that somebody like Trump was just, in many cases was, perfect to seize the anger and the frustration that was building up. All right. Well, I'm not going to ask you to give us any teasers or or leaks. I would say, um, Will you come back on when the book is out? I would love to, <laughs> yes, if you'll have me. All right, in the meantime, how can people can read you at the New York Times? How That's can they right. follow, follow me on, on Twitter? Twitter? Yeah, JW Peters, NYT, Facebook, all that. Awesome. Well, Jeremy yeah. Peters, thank you for coming on the news. Well, thanks for having me. If you like this podcast, rate and review it on iTunes. Follow Matt on Twitter at Matt K. Lewis. Thank you for listening to Matt Lewis and the News.